From Harry's actions, we see that he recognizes torture, severe punishment, and even death as a means to his heroic ends. I've done some reactions to Harry Potter fan films, and today we're going to take a look at a video that so many people sent me. People who sent me this were literally offended by this video, like cursing, getting angry, and just roasting the video in general, and I thought, it can't be that bad. So I clicked on the link and was brought to a video by a channel called The Take, which is a pretty big channel having 1.2 million subscribers. Immediately, I look at the like to dislike ratio and see that there are far more dislikes than likes, which right away made me say, oh boy, this is not going to be good. So I sat down and watched the video, and I immediately knew that I had to make a counter argument with my own video. I've been making Harry Potter videos on YouTube for over three years now, and I have to say that Potterheads on YouTube are some of the nicest people. They always give good comments, always give me good like to dislike ratios, and are just kind in general. So to see these same people that support me hate on this video so much, that's how you know there's a problem. The video was called, Harry Potter is kind of a bad guy, but they changed the title after they got roasted. They changed the title to, Harry Potter, hero but not a role model. So let's dive into why this video was so disliked. Before I get into it though, I just want to say that this is not going to be a mean-spirited video. It's simply going to be an analysis on why I think they're wrong using cold hard facts from the books and movies. I have nothing against this channel. In fact, this is the only video of theirs that I've ever seen. I'm sure they have other great videos, but I am not looking at their channel as a whole. I'm looking at this one video. So now that I've said that, let's get into it. He's egotistical, recklessly impulsive, and self-centered. He always assumes he knows best and treats the people around him badly. So that right there is the main argument for this video on why Harry is bad. A bad case of main character syndrome. So point one in their essay, Harry's behavior is guided by ego. Because he's the famous boy who lived, he gets special treatment. This understanding that he's special shapes his personality from this point on, and his ego gradually inflates with every movie. They then talk about Harry's ego through the eyes of Snape, the person that had a grudge against him from the moment he entered Hogwarts and probably even before that, because Harry's father bullied Snape and in Snape's eyes stole the woman he loved from him. First of all, if your argument is through the eyes of someone who possibly hates Harry more than anybody else, that just makes everything you say about it invalid. And they did mention this point, but it was mixed with all of these clips of Snape making fun of Harry's fame. And while it's easy for us to dismiss Snape's comments as biased, unnecessary bullying because the story is framed sympathetically to Harry, Clearly, fame isn't everything, is it, Mr. Potter? The young wizard's actions reveal there's a lot of truth to what Snape is saying. So the first time I watched this, I was like, okay, I'll let them explain themselves on why they think Snape might be right and I'll hear them out. But then they just jump right into the next point of the video without any explanation. They did not even attempt to elaborate on their very controversial statement. So since they didn't add an argument on why they think Snape is right about Harry having an ego due to his fame, I'll just insert my own argument on why I think Snape is wrong. Harry never enjoyed his fame. In fact, he actually resented it. If anything, his fame actually hurt his ego because people were constantly whispering about him in the halls, people were always staring at him, and it always made him very uncomfortable. In the Chamber of Secrets, there's this one scene that demonstrates this perfectly. After Draco made a big deal about Colin Creevy asking Harry for a signed photo, and Lockhart made it worse by making it a double portrait signed by both of them, Harry sped away and went to class where he sat in the back of the classroom not wanting to interact with anybody, and Ron said that his face was so red he could fry an egg on it. Then when Ron joked about Colin and Ginny starting a Harry Potter fan club, Harry angrily told him to shut up. That sure doesn't seem like someone who enjoyed being famous. Then the point that the take made about Harry getting more ego because of his fame as the series went on. Let's just go over something in the sixth book. So it had just come out in the press that Harry was the chosen one, meaning he had even more attention and fame, now being the boy who lived and the chosen one. So when he boarded the Hogwarts Express in his sixth year, it said, People stared shamelessly as he approached. They even pressed their faces against the windows of their compartments to get a look at him. He had expected an upswing in the amount of gaping and gawping he would have to endure this term after all the Chosen One rumors in the Daily Prophet, but he did not enjoy the sensation of standing in a very bright spotlight. Clearly, Harry has never enjoyed the attention his fame brought him, not in the beginning of the series, nor in the end. So moving on to the next point that the take makes, they say that Harry is entitled. 
from his steadfast belief that rules don't apply to him, to his never bothering to listen to the advice of adults. Harry is a bundle of arrogant impulses. They go on to expand on Harry not listening to adults when he questions Dumbledore's decision to leave Harry in the dark and ignore Harry for almost that whole book. He questions Dumbledore's decision to prohibit Ron and Hermione from writing to him, even though Dumbledore is the most powerful wizard alive, and it's safe to say probably knows better than a relatively unremarkable teenager. The thing is, it was clearly stated that Dumbledore keeping Harry in the dark was a bad decision on Dumbledore's part. Dumbledore himself admitted that he was wrong for keeping Harry in the dark about the Order, and more importantly, about what the Order's main job was, which was protecting the prophecy that was about him and Voldemort. I thought by distancing myself from you, as I have done all year, you'd be less tempted. In the book, he says, If I had been open with you, Harry, as I should have been, you would have known a long time ago that Voldemort might try to lure you to the Department of Mysteries, and you would not have been tricked into going there tonight. Dumbledore knew that had he kept Harry informed the way Harry wanted to be, things would have turned out a lot better. Dumbledore even said that because he didn't keep Harry informed about what was going on, he blamed himself for Sirius's death. It is my fault Sirius died, said Dumbledore clearly. Moving on to the take's next point. Harry is convinced that he knows precisely how to handle the situation because he was the one who first witnessed Voldemort's return. But Harry's specialness in relation to Voldemort is situational a result of events that happened to him when he was a baby. Harry doesn't seem to grasp that this relationship isn't proof of any particular merit or insight he possesses. So you're right, him being made into a horcrux as a baby doesn't grant him any merit, because obviously he was a baby and it was his mother that put a protection on him. But what does grant him merit are the things he's done since then. He faced Voldemort in his first year of Hogwarts and nearly died, being in a coma for three days. In the book, he refused to let go of Quirrell's face, and had Dumbledore not arrived to pull him off, Harry would have died, all to ensure that Voldemort did not use the Philosopher's Stone to revive himself. Then, in his second year, he defeated a freaking basilisk that was controlled by Voldemort. This was a 12-year-old kid that did this. Most fully realized wizards couldn't even dream of doing that. And on top of that, he once again stopped Voldemort from reviving himself. Then he produced a full Patronus at the age of 13. Again, something that a lot of fully realized wizards couldn't do, proving his powerful with and without magic, defeating the Basilisk with a sword in combat, and producing very advanced charms for his age. Then he faced Voldemort and a whole group of Death Eaters with a broken leg by the way. His leg broke in the maze right before he touched the port key, and once again, he escaped with his life. So yeah. He's proven that he can hold his own. It goes past just his first encounter with Voldemort when he was a baby. That's irrelevant compared to the stuff that he's done in recent years. Moving on. And when Snape and Dumbledore push him to master Occlumency lessons, Harry barely puts in any effort. In fact, he sees it as an opportunity to get back at Snape. Harry did put work into Occlumency, but it was hard when Snape, a man who hated him, was going deep into his mind. Feeling sentimental. That's private. Harry hated those lessons because of Snape, and Dumbledore later said that having Snape teach him was a mistake, and that he himself should have done it. The take then goes on to say that Harry not taking Occlumency lessons seriously led to Sirius' death. But as we already discussed, Dumbledore said it was not Harry's fault, but his fault that Harry was lured to the Department of Mysteries, and his fault that Sirius died. And going back to this one point, here I'll play it again. In fact, he sees it as an opportunity to get back at Snape. He didn't use this as an opportunity to get back at Snape. Going into Snape's past was a complete accident, and Harry actually came out of that memory being more sympathetic towards Snape after seeing his father bully him. He in no way used those memories as a weapon. He was actually disturbed by them and stood up for Snape in his own head. What was making Harry feel so horrified and unhappy was not being shouted at or having jars thrown at him. It was that he knew how it felt to be humiliated in the middle of a circle by onlookers, knew exactly how Snape had felt as his father had taunted him. The take's next point is that Harry is impulsive and makes rash decisions that put those around him in danger. Blinded by rage, Harry ignores his friend's reasoning and brings everyone along with him into the most avoidable conflict of the entire series. At this point, I feel like they didn't even read the books or see the movies. Because in both, Harry wanted to go by himself. He did not want to put anyone else in danger, but his friends forced themselves on him. Alert the order if you can. 
Are you mental? We're going with you. It's too dangerous. Look, I've got you into enough trouble as it is. Maybe you don't have to do this all by yourself, mate. So now we're going to move on to the next section of their video. And the title of this section alone makes me roll my eyes. Angstier than your average adolescent. Now, granted, Harry's selfishness may scan as pretty typical behavior for an angsty adolescent, but it's made worse by his circumstances. As the hero, however reluctant, Harry has a responsibility to know better. He should be constantly aware of how influential his every action can be. This whole statement has nothing to do with what Harry is as a character or how he acts. He rarely speaks up to anyone besides those closest to him, and he never uses his fame to influence people because honestly, he doesn't enjoy his fame. He's not going to use it because he likes to ignore it. In fact, the only time Harry really used his fame to influence people was one, when he tried to warn everybody that Voldemort had returned, which was noble, but he had it slammed back in his face, everyone calling him a liar. Then two, he spoke up about the night in the graveyard and let Rita Skeeter write an article about it, his hope being that this would open people's eyes to the danger that was out there. Both of these seem like he used his influence in a good way, and might I add, in a way that was not easy for him having to relive that awful night in the graveyard. The take then goes on a rant about how Harry is not a good role model, and he's actually a typical male hero, or a male in general. Many of Harry's failings are also tellingly qualities generally associated with male heroes, and men more generally. The thing is, Harry is pretty selfless when it comes to saving people. He risks his neck all the time, and it's been stated in the books that he might have a bit of a hero complex because he tries to save people too often. That doesn't sound like the male characters the take was trying to compare him to with Wolverine and Iron Man. Those are two characters who are pretty selfish and pretty reluctant to help other people in the beginning. They're always thinking about themselves before anyone else. That's the point of their characters. They evolve and learn to care for others. And in the end, they do, but they didn't start out that way. In writing, they are characters that we call reluctant heroes. Meanwhile, Harry is selfless from day one and jumps to help others without a second thought. We see this from the start of the series to the very end. His selflessness never wavers. In writing, he's a character that you would call a willing hero. So for the take to compare these characters when they literally have the opposite titles, it's just ridiculous. Also, I'll add that Harry might even be too much of a hero or too selfless with his hero complex wanting to save everybody, basically making the take statement that he's the typical asshole male character even more invalid. The take then goes on to say this about Harry. And so what Harry gets away with is really a reflection on his world's values. He just doesn't ever face much reckoning for his faults and mistakes, and so isn't given a great chance of overcoming them. But this means he's not exactly a model lesson for modern viewers. So let's go over this. They completely missed the point of Harry's character arc. They list these times when Harry broke the rules, breaking all the rules when he went down to the Chamber of Secrets to save Ginny, or disobeying the rules about being up at night and going to the corridor that was out of bounds when he went after the Philosopher's Stone to stop Voldemort. And the take says that he was rewarded for these bad behaviors instead of being punished, which diminishes his heroics. But though he broke the rules, the rules are insignificant compared to what he did, selflessly putting his life on the line to save others, or to protect the world from the darkest wizard in history. He went through hell and almost died multiple times, and those trials are what define him as a hero. That's what defines his character, him risking his neck for others. He's not breaking the rules just to be a dick. He's breaking the rules to save people, and in no way should he ever be punished for that. For the take to base their entire argument on why he's not a hero on him breaking a few school rules is absurd. Look at the big picture. A girl who everyone thought was dead was saved. The most terrifying wizard in wizarding history was stopped from coming back. And though the take didn't mention this, we see this a lot in the earlier books. They use a time turner illegally, but they save two innocent lives. Harry making the choices to break the rules in order to save people is what make him a hero. He makes the tough decisions, and if we look at the results, most of the time it was the right decision. The Philosopher's Stone, safe. Ginny, alive. Sirius and Buckbeak, alive and free. These first three books are his trials, preparing him for the darkness and war that is coming, which starts in the very next book and it continues for the rest of the series. Rowling purposefully made Harry have similar challenges at the end of the first three books. Him deciding to break the rules to save people in all three books is no coincidence. The take just missed this classic hero writing structure that so many classic stories follow and narrowed in on something that was so irrelevant to make their pointless argument that Harry is a bad person. 
Moving on, the take says that Harry is prejudiced against Slytherins. Harry also reflects the limitations of his Gryffindor culture by being shockingly narrow-minded, even outright prejudiced against Slytherins. It's pretty much guaranteed that he'll blame a Slytherin for what's happening, which often leads him to be wrong. Well, again, let's look at the facts. Sure, he wasn't right about Malfoy being the one who opened the Chamber of Secrets, but Harry was right about their family. Draco's father Lucius was a Death Eater. Malfoy becomes a Death Eater. Then in the sixth book, nobody, and I mean nobody, not even Ron, Hermione, Mr. Weasley, or even Lupin believed him that Draco was a Death Eater. But guess who was right? Harry. The next section of their video was called Harry and Voldemort, Two Sides of the Same Coin. Surprisingly, the take correctly states that the difference between Harry and Voldemort are the choices they make, which is true. According to Dumbledore, the choices they make are what define them as good or evil. Tom chooses to be evil. Harry chooses to be good. The take goes off that point, saying that Harry is more similar to Voldemort than different. In fact, what we actually see in the story emphasizes Harry's similarity to Voldemort far more than his difference. And I'm like, okay, I'll listen. Tell me why. But then, instead of explaining how their choices make them similar, the take proceeds to talk about their physical similarities and their life patterns that they have no control of. Growing up as orphans, living in homes where they're not wanted. And right there, they completely lost me. They talk about how their choices define each character, and then give evidence defending this statement by listing things that neither of them had any control of. They did not choose to be orphans or get put into a home that they didn't like. Using those examples of them choosing good versus evil is completely pointless because they didn't have a choice. They then go on to say, Both Harry and Tom are filled with feelings and impulses they can't seem to control. I swear I don't know! <laughs> One minute the glass was there and then it was gone! It was like magic! Let's just take a minute to look at this. They seem to be talking about their impulses before knowing they were wizards. Before Harry knew he was a wizard, his impulses made glass disappear and made his hair grow back after a bad haircut. Before Voldemort knew he was a wizard, he used magic to kill a bunny that belonged to another kid in the orphanage by hanging it. And on another occasion, led kids from the orphanage into a cave where he scarred them so badly using magic that they were never the same again. Those are two completely different levels. Voldemort's impulses led him to use magic in very evil ways, while Harry's impulses led him to use magic in very harmless ways. Even Harry blowing up his aunt is mild compared to what Voldemort did. And just for the record, Harry's aunt didn't fly away like in the movie. She never left the house. The movie was just very dramatic about it. Moving on to their next point on why Harry and Voldemort are similar. Well, I'll just play the clip. Fundamentally, both believe it's okay to do dark things as a means to an end. So, they compare Harry letting the centaurs take umbrage to Voldemort telling Nagini to viciously kill Snape. First of all, Harry did not put Umbridge in that situation. She did by threatening the centaurs, calling them half-breeds, and choking a centaur near to death with a rope. Also, in the book, Harry didn't let them take her. He didn't even have a choice. Let me read this passage from the book as the centaurs charged at Umbridge. Harry grabbed Hermione and pulled her to the ground. Face down on the forest floor, he knew a moment of terror as hooves thundered around him, but the centaurs leapt over and around them, bellowing and screaming with rage. Harry then heard Umbridge being dragged away while he was still on the ground. There was nothing he could have done. And even if we go by the movie's canon where Harry says, Tell them I need to home! I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. The centaurs were not going to listen to him. To be honest, they probably would have taken Harry with them. So to compare Harry acting in a way to protect himself and Hermione to Voldemort telling his snake that has a piece of his own soul inside of it by the way, to kill Snape is just not comparable in the slightest. To even think of comparing these two scenes is ludicrous. Comparing Harry to Voldemort like the take is trying to do in this whole section of the video is just pointless. Because if you bring up any situation that Harry was in throughout the entire series, 90% of the time, Voldemort would act in the opposite way. He's selfish and cruel, while Harry is selfless and kind. You have a weak one, and you'll never know love or friendship. And I feel sorry for you. And now we get to one of the craziest lines in the whole video. When his impulses get the best of him, Harry doesn't hesitate to inflict pain on others. <laughs> what? Upon finding out that Peter Pettigrew betrayed his parents, Harry's instant reaction is to send him to the Dementors where he'll be tortured. Actually, no. Harry literally stopped Wormtail from being murdered right then and there in the shack by Sirius and Lupin. 
But if Voldemort didn't kill you, then we would. Together. No! Hey. This man... Is... I know what he is. He instead wanted to hand Pettigrew over to the Ministry, clear Sirius's name, and then let Pettigrew get the fate that was written in stone through Pettigrew's own actions. He had worked with Voldemort, giving him loads of information. He killed 13 muggles. He faked his own death, was an illegal animagus, and just to add the cherry on top, he betrayed his best friends. This plotline of Harry saving Pettigrew from being murdered that night was even brought up in the final book. When Harry reminds Pettigrew of this, he realizes that Harry was right, and he goes on to choke himself to death with his own hand. And even then, Harry tried desperately to save Pettigrew from killing himself. Harry did not inflict pain on Pettigrew. If anything, he saved his life on two occasions. Moving on to the next character that Harry inflicted pain on. He waffles when it comes to saving Cedric in the maze, Actually, in the book, this never happened. In the book, Harry actually saved Cedric right away, and it was in a situation that put himself in much more danger. A huge spider was coming towards Cedric, and he tripped. The spider started bearing down on him, and seeing this, Harry shot a spell at the spider to get its attention away from Cedric, saving his life. And then when the spider was coming after Harry, the two worked together to stun the spider. So if anything, this moment shows that Harry is even more of a selfless hero than before. Also, even if we go by the movie, he still saved Cedric's life in the end. The next person they say Harry inflicted pain on is Bellatrix when he used the Cruciatus Curse on her. And yeah, that's a valid point. But when he did this, the spell did not fully work. And after he did it, Bellatrix got up hardly phased and said, Never used an unforgivable curse, have you boy? You need to mean them, Potter. You need to really want to cause pain, to enjoy it. So all that this proves is that even when this woman had killed the closest thing he had to a parent right in front of him, Harry still didn't want to cause her enough pain to make that curse work. He was holding back on this insanely dangerous and evil woman who just killed Sirius. Just another example that Harry isn't a bad person the way Voldemort is, the thing that the take is trying so desperately to get us to believe. And their next point is Harry inflicting pain on Draco in the sixth book. In The Half-Blood Prince, Harry also uses a spell he doesn't understand on Draco. They're literally just eating their own words, a spell that he doesn't understand. He didn't know what would happen, and afterwards, he was horrified at what he had just done. He didn't enjoy this moment. That's not the kind of guy Harry is. We see point after point in this video of the take trying to convince us that Harry is this bad person with bad intentions, but almost every point that the take makes is easily countered if you're a true Harry Potter fan, or even if you just understand basic writing and character development. Obviously, Harry isn't perfect, everybody makes mistakes, but at the end of the day, Harry almost always makes the right choice or makes up for the wrong choice that he made before. But this next line bothers me more than any other line in the video. From Harry's actions, we see that he recognizes torture, severe punishment, and even death as a means to his heroic ends. This statement is just so ridiculous to me, because if you look at the story instead of trying to reach for these outrageous ideas, you'll see that not a word of it is true. Harry not being able to fully torture Bellatrix shows that that isn't who he is. He doesn't want or like to torture. He doesn't recognize it as part of his heroics the way the take is saying. They say that Harry recognizes death, which is just not true at all. I'm shaking my head because it literally just seems like they did no research for this video whatsoever. The only good point that they make in this video is when they quote another writer about Neville's character. They then go on this rant about why Hermione should have been the main character. But perhaps Hermione is the truest hero of the series. So maybe it should have been called Hermione Granger and the Sorcerer's Stone instead. And that's literally how they end the video. I'm not kidding. Yes, Hermione is great, but she isn't a hero like Harry. She herself even admits this in the very first book and movie. You're a great wizard. You really are. Not as good as you. <laughs> Me. Books and cleverness. And more important things. Friendship and bravery. Rowling wrote Harry's character with the intention of him being the protagonist, meaning the main hero, and she wrote Hermione with the intention of her being what's called a confidant character, meaning the best friend and sidekick to the protagonist. They were created to fit that role, they're not interchangeable. That's writing 101. Hermione plays her part well, but she could never take the place of the hero. The take tried to tell us that Harry is a villainous character. When we zero in on Harry's villainous aspects, his egoism, his impulsiveness, even his capacity for cruelty, 
it's hard not to reframe him as an anti-hero. But just by poking a few holes in their logic and giving evidence from the books and movies, it's clear that he's not egotistical as he hates the fame that was forced on him. He's not impulsive the way the take tried to say, trying to compare him to Voldemort and his dark impulses of hanging bunnies, scarring kids for life, and killing without a second thought. Things that would never cross Harry's mind. And he does not show cruelty. Every example they listed on how he was cruel, I countered and went over why those examples are bogus. Harry is not a villain or an anti-hero. He is just a clean and cut hero. Simple as that. Thank you so much for watching guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and more of this little dude. If you like this video, hit that like button and subscribe. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.